and then share with you something that's fresh to me. I'm I'm preaching from the book of James at the present time. Um, when you've been preaching for a long time, and I have, um, it's always a challenge to, to stay fresh and to find material that um, challenges you to think and to pray. And so I believe God led me to the book of James, and it's been a real delight. I've not finished the first chapter yet, but when I was studying it, it appeared to me to be very, very um, appropriate for us in the present generation. So if you've got your Bible, turn with me just to the beginning of the book of James. Um, the way that James introduces himself is, first of all, a, a, a real example to us, an encouragement. He begins by describing himself as, as a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James is Jesus' half-brother. If most people had been related to Jesus in modern times, they would want you to know, wouldn't they? They would have started off by saying, listen to me, I knew Jesus, I, I grew up with him, I, I understood what he did, uh, and they would be boasting. But James's humility just permeates the, the letter. And I think there's a lesson there for us as Christians continually that we need to know that humility of grace. Peter tells us that we are to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand in, in the knowledge that, um, that the devil was about like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so we are, we are called upon to walk humbly before God. And when you recognize how much of a, a sinner you are and how little you deserve God's amazing grace, then it should have this effect on us. And then if you remember what a bond servant was, it's way back, I think it's Deuteronomy, isn't it? Where if you got into debt, you could clear your debt by working for the person you owed to. And so you became their servant. And when the debt was cleared, you were given permission to leave, but you could choose to stay. And if you chose to stay, they would pin your ear to the doorpost and you became a bond servant, a willing servant, a, a servant who has recognized the, the greatness of the master. And so James begins showing us what it is to be humble and reminding us of what a privilege it is to be a Christian. When you think how different our backgrounds were and how we grew up in many different places, and yet the same God gave his son for us, the same God has called us by his word and through the power of his Holy Spirit and has brought us into the kingdom of God. And when you realize what an incredible thing it is God has done for you, you don't want to leave, do you? There's nowhere else to go, I know, but sometimes Satan suggests foolishly that you might be better off elsewhere, but it's a choice to remain as a Christian. And that's important in a world which is as confused and muddled as ours. He's writing to the 12 tribes who are scattered abroad. That seems to link in with Acts chapter 8, where the Apostle Paul, after the death of Stephen, is causing havoc in the church. And so many of those who had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost and other reasons were now scattered throughout what we know as the Roman Empire. And the, the use of 12 tribes would seem to indicate they're primarily of Jewish descent, but they're scattered everywhere. They're in a world full of difficulty and trouble. And that was the very first thing that struck me about James, that he's writing to Christians who are very like us. Here we are, even today, scattered across this country from top to bottom. Um, and we, we realize that we, we're out of step with society, we're out of step with our culture because we've chosen to be born servants of Jesus Christ. And so as you get this introduction, then it whets your appetite for what follows. James is going to, to speak words which will be a help and an encouragement to Christians who are challenged by the world and the culture that they're living in. And the instruction that comes 
in the beginning of chapter one uh, are quite profound. Uh, I'm, I'm debating with myself whether to go through the whole chapter, but I won't. Uh, we need to just stick at the part that applies to us. So here James gives us a statement which goes completely against the grain and the thinking, doesn't it, in verse two. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Surely that is a, a, a very important um, instruction or commandment from the Lord that is in what's called the imperative tense. So it's no, it's not if you feel like it. It's friends, understand that this is the world that God has placed us in. We are the remnant appointed to be a witness and a testimony for God. And it's an incredible thing that anybody should know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I, I find myself thinking recently, you know, all this took place 2000 years ago, and yet it's still absolutely relevant today as if it had just happened yesterday. And so when I read about what's happening in the, the, the scatter, um, among the scattered Christians, I, I can see here instruction for you, for you and for me. We are brothers and sisters, and then count it all joy. That very phrase takes time to sink in. It's easy to say just a few words, but it's a lifetime's work because we are human. We do feel the rejection. We do feel the way that society and culture has turned its back on the word of God. We do feel the way that, that the church or the established church has now become, can I call it a laughing stock without being too offensive? Where it's become a real tangled mess. And yet the Lord says, count it all joy. Look at it differently. Look at it as the world that God has appointed you to live in. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. One of the points about James chapter one is the use of the word trials and temptation. For those of you who know a little bit of Bible languages, you'll know it's the same word in Greek. And James deliberately starts off with trials. Way down in verse 12, he says, blessed is the man who endures temptations. What's the difference between a trial and a temptation? A trial is something that God allows to develop our faith and to increase our confidence in him. I, I compared it when I was preaching to the gymnasium or the athletes uh, training. These people all started off as, as weaklings, but through committed, determined exercise, they built muscles, developed strength, developed stamina, and they were able then to go on out into the world. And so the thing, one of the things that's challenged me from James is this, is this need to not complain about what's going on, but rather to, to, to say to the Lord, I know that this can do me good. For a start, you see, it's, it's changed what you and I do on a Saturday morning. What did you do on a Saturday morning four years ago? I'm sure there's a, a, a different answer for each individual, but so many people now are saying how much they appreciate this meeting on a Saturday morning, how important it is to them. And here we are three years on and we're here because we recognize that God is challenging us to draw near to him and assures us in that promise that when we draw near to him and trust him, then it will in fact increase the muscles of our faith. Look at how he writes on, how he goes on, knowing. I'm sorry if I'm pausing at every word, but knowing is important, isn't it? Not just thinking, not just hoping or imagining, but knowing. The Lord Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation. You know the next words, don't you? Be of good cheer. Count it all joy. I have overcome the world. Knowing, and that knowledge that we have is a knowledge which is built on the scripture. 
and the revelation of God. It's not something you'll find in Wikipedia or Encyclopedia Britannica. It's, it comes from reading the word. You've been reading this book for a long time, most of us, from our general sort of age. And, and it, it's to become a, a foundation for us, a, a place to step out from so that we're not surprised at what's happening in society when Christ has been abandoned. We've gone back to what it was like in the first century. Again, uh, as I've been studying this, I've been trying to think what was it like to be a Christian in the first century in the Roman world. There was no four or 500 years of sort of Christian principles built into society. People were horrible. People were wicked. They, they boasted about wickedness. Roman soldiers came back from battle and they were praised because of how many people they had killed. If a girl was born to a Roman family, it was quite legitimate just to put her outside and let her die. Immorality was rampant. And so James says to the church, and God through James says to you and I, you need to understand from a, a biblical perspective what's happening. Here's what he says. Notice those words, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Patience is another beautiful word in the, the scripture. I often try to illustrate it with a car tire. Have you ever looked at your car tires? They're the most incredible thing in the world. Pieces of rubber filled with air, and yet they have this ability to move and shape so that you can travel the road, hopefully within the speed limits, quite safely. And patience is like that kind of perspective where you're able to bend and move always within the, the limits of scripture, and, and to cope with the bumps, the twists, the turns. And so these trials, which we're having today, are designed to get us to that place where we have patience. Notice how he goes on. But let, not notice the but. I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't prepare this. It's coming straight off the top of my head. Notice the but. He's picked up on the sort of an attitude where somebody might say, yes, I agree, but, but let patience have its perfect work. Notice again the let, and if I remember correctly, it, again, it's an imperative, it's a command. It's not if it suits you. This is how to cope. This is how to keep your balance in this crazy world, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Well, there's a whole, a whole theme to develop on what perfection is in the Bible. We've been made perfect in Christ, but we are, in fact, being perfected. Do you ever stop and look at that? I think it's Hebrews 10, 14. We are being perfected. And it fits in exactly what we we'll have here, isn't it? He says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be, so that, so that you will grow in grace and holiness, so that your trust in God will, in fact, be anchored solid. And in that sense, we are then equipped for every challenge and blessing. But notice now how he goes on. Again, it's as if he, he anticipates that, that there are people saying, what? What do you mean? How does that work? So he says, if any man, sorry, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You remember what wisdom is? There's a whole book in the Old Testament on wisdom. In fact, in my study, there are two books in the Old Testament on wisdom. One of them is Proverbs. The other one is the book of Job. It's an example of understanding how the world works, understanding how God works in the world, and how that the best thing a, a Christian can do is see things from God's perspective. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom brings understanding. It helps us to 
see what's going on and not be browbeaten and defeated because of circumstances. And by saying if any one of you lacks wisdom, it would seem to indicate there are going to be umpteen times when we lack wisdom. Do you never scratch your head at the news? Do you never scratch your head at what's going on in culture around you? Where did all this wickedness come from? It, 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 it would have seemed to have been held down by Christianity. I'm reading a book, I mentioned it last week, Hideous Strength by Melvin Tinker. I nearly forgot his name there. Really profoundly challenging. And, and, and Tinker brings out the fact that what we are seeing began in the 1920s when there was a group of people who sat down and planned and plotted for what is now the reality in society. Christianity in the 1920s went, began to go downhill. In fact, Spurgeon detected it in the 1800s, didn't he? The downgrade controversy. But I always link the 20s and 30s with the sort of the overflow of liberalism. It was then the fundamentalist movement began as a response to it, wasn't it? But right there at that very time when Christians perhaps were rejoicing and that was it 10 fundamentals they had identified, Satan was working. And he could see and was patient to wait until the present time so that now we have horrendous things taking place. The book by Tinker is, is, is really scary. I read also the, the booklet by Nick Needham on Gnosticism. I just read it last night. It's available free from the Christian Institute and you can read it online. You don't have to spend any money for it. Um, but again, he, he's arguing, you see, that what we are seeing is in fact a return to first century Gnosticism where um, even the, the, the sexual changes that are going on were part of Gnostic philosophy. All of this is going on all around us. And if you don't, I certainly do, you sit up sometimes and say, what, what on earth is going on? Is God still in his heavens? Is he still ruling and reigning over all things on behalf of his church? Ephesians 1, isn't it? And therefore, what I need to do is to come back and be like James, humble myself under his mighty hand and to make known to God my desire for his will and purpose to prosper. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then to seek from him the grace to go on living. It's important, you see, that he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. And surely that's why you're here this morning. We are asking, ask, seek, knock. And you know how to fill in all the bits that go with that. And I, I, I really enjoyed the end of verse five. You know, sometimes you come to God and you think, oh, I've said this so many times, you must be sick and tired of me. That's not what this says. He says, who gives to all liberally. There's the first point. There's buckets of it. And without reproach, he doesn't say, you stupid fool. And it will be given to him. The next verse is where I want to sort of draw to a conclusion. But let him ask in faith. What is faith? It's our response by the Holy Spirit to the word of God. It's us saying, I believe what God has said, even though I don't sense what, it's, what he said. I believe that God is working, and that's where the history books help us tremendously, is it not? You, you read of these accounts of men and women of all types being transformed by an encounter with a living God. And therefore, we're full of hope. Who knows how long this might continue? I pray it's not much longer. But my, my, my calling is to be like James, and as James is trying to encourage these scattered Christians, stand fast, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, just to hold your ground. And then look to God to do what you and I can't, because he's still actively 
calling out his elect from all parts of the world. You need to read what's going on in, in, in parts of Africa. I read, is it Murph's little bulletin just recently about the Berber people in the middle of the Sahara Desert and the work of God that's going on and your eyes pop out your head. Because God is still drawing out his people and assembling them. It's our business then to allow this to make us stronger in the faith rather than weaker and to hold on to God. Tomorrow, God willing, I'm going to preach from verse 16, 17 and 18. And verse 16 is where I'm going to finish. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. It's led me to think about the fact that in the garden, Satan's first attack was to deceive. And it comes up a couple of times in the New Testament that it's particularly pointed out that, that Christians need to be alert and not allow the enemy through what looks attractive to the eye to take us off course. And here we are then, gathered to pray, pleading with God to give us grace, to build our faith, to increase our confidence that God is working all things together for good to them that love him, to them that are the called according to his purpose. There should not be a doubt, but of course that's Satan's area, isn't it? As God really said, was how he got Eve off track. And he'll do the same to you and me. And so James is a fantastic work to encourage you and me to hold fast, to lay hold on God, to claim his promises, and to stand back and watch. For he who began this good work in you will bring it to completion. May our faith and confidence in him, not ourselves, be strong and powerful. Amen. 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 Let me just stop this recording.